Yes. You know. yes. Yeah. My number two. Yeah. Oops. Okay, I think our mics are on. Does that mean that we should begin? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for for uh, for, for joining us here this morning. I think. Um, I'm Ben Smith. I'm the editor of Semaphore. I, I guess I think showing up for an 8:30 a.m. panel in Switzerland is like the opposite of quiet quitting. So I hope you will um, have empathy for the people we are talking about who did not. Um, and, and thanks particularly for to to, to the the um, WEF team who prepared me incredibly well for this panel. Um, I hope. I should also say that I've noticed at least two of the world's leading experts on this, these subjects in the audience, Kevin and Julia, which is slightly disconcerting. Um, <laughs> But in any case, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and this, this is going to be a hopefully free-flowing discussion with four, four people who've thought incredibly deeply about these questions about work and the future of work. Quiet quitting itself is kind of you know, a, a term that is quite contested by some of, some of our speakers um, and some, you know, who are both in, in, in thinking very hard about about work and, and, and the changing nature of work and operating very big, complicated businesses in that space. And so, so that's what we're going to talk about. I think we have uh, 45 minutes. The last 10 will be questions. So please think about questions, which should be one sentence and in the form of a question. Um, <laughs> The, uh, um, and, 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 and just to, the WEF has also thought a lot about these questions, um, you know, and, and about the solutions which they call good work, range from you know health and well-being, promoting fairness, and that, this is the sort of WEF framework which you can find on their website. And I think there's like a QR code, um, but I, I will introduce um, introduce our speakers uh, from 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 left to right. Uh, Thierry Delaporte runs uh, WePro, which is a, a um, enormous 260,000 employee company, an IT services company that um, you know, started in Bangalore. He's based in Paris, both attempts to solve and in deals with these problems every day. Um, Martin Ferland um, um, is, is, uh, leads the Mercer, Mercer which is the uh, Martian McLennan's HR and, and investment consulting group also thinks about this stuff a lot. Adam Grant tweets a lot about quiet quitting, hates the phrase, and is an organizational psychologist who, um, who you know, will, has, thought, has thought a lot about this. And, and Anjali Sood runs Vimeo, where she both uh, you know, manages people and deals with this question and has also changed the company to respond to, respond to some of these challenges. Um, and Adam, I guess I could start with you just to sort of set the table on you know, what are we talking about here? What, what is the sort of underlying organizational psychology around these changing nature of work and the, what the and so called quiet quitting? <laughs> well, yeah, I do hate the term, Ben, because it suggests that employees are giving up. When in fact, quiet quitting, or whatever you call it, is a natural response to feeling that your employer or your boss has given up on you. So you blame the bosses? Um, more sure than anyone else, right. for sure. So, it's a tough know, crowd for that. <laughs> well, I, I think this is the crowd that needs to hear it, let's be clear. Um, good morning, Davos. So I think that you know, we, we've had terms for this for generations, right? We used to call it phoning it in. Before we had phones, it was called mailing it in. This is not a new phenomenon. It's not specific to any generation. Um, one of the classic studies was done in the late 1980s, and the finding was you could tell who was going to quote unquote quiet quit six months before it happened. Uh, it happened when people felt dissatisfied with their jobs, but they did not have a voice. Um, and eventually, they said, you know what? No one cares about me. I'm going to stop caring. Um, and uh, Martin, you, you, you guys have done some research recently on, on, on I, how, basically how executives are thinking about and responding to this. I think about 50% of C-suite executives are, you know, are at least open to the possibility of fairly dramatic change. I'm just curious what you found. And, how you're thinking about it. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. It's nice to have buzzwords so, so that we coalesce on, on a particular issue. Uh, but I totally agree. It always has existed. I think it might be exacerbated by the all that we've gone through over the last uh, few years, for sure. And the good news is, though, so that um, our data also shows that uh, actually employers are the most trusted bodies out there compared to NGOs, governments, and media. Sorry to say, Ben. <laughs> we are fully used to it. And therefore, if we can think together as employers, as corporate uh, bodies, t as to how we address that, I think there's a hope that we can at least reduce the number. I think, Adam, you're the psychologist here. Uh, there probably will always be uh, that phenomenon. But the problem is uh, when you have a high proportion of people uh, that act that way. And I thought as I 
sit here that I would start by looking at my watch and the ceiling and quite quit a little bit and show what <laughs> it looks like. But basically, uh, we are told that um, a third of the employers think that's a big issue for their firm. Um, a third of the employers that we survey um, every year as well, they told us that it's going to be uh, just having the employees being engaged, being uh, thriving at work uh, is one of the top five issues they have on their radar right now. And it's also connected to high attrition and the difficulty in hiring and finding uh, the great talent that they need. Um, Anjali, do, do you sort of agree that, I mean, I think you were, you are in, when people sort of use these buzzwords, they are really thinking about North American creative employees, like your employees and my employees, first of all. And I'm curious, do you, do you I guess, first of all, agree that there's nothing has changed and this is all this is and that, and that these are just buzzwords or do you have, or have you seen something new in the last couple of years with your people yeah i mean yeah the vimeo workforce is is quite progressive in nature and um, my general view is i i don't think it's new i do think and i agree with you adam that it's on leaders and companies and to change but i will say i think we're in a unique world right now where <coughs> what the next generation expects and needs to be engaged in their personal lives has not translated to work. And there's a fairly necessary reskilling, I would say, of leaders. If we want, how are we gonna communicate and engage with distributed teams? Um, and how are we gonna align people and um, connect with them in this sort of digital world? And I think that actually is a bit of a house on fire because I don't think most leaders feel equipped uh, to do that. It's not a skill set most of us kind of moved up the ranks being great at. And I do think that without it, um, this, this same phenomenon of phoning it in or quiet quitting can in fact lead then to not being able to retain um, and make productive great talent, especially in an environment right now where we all need more impact and productivity from our teams. And, and I'm Thierry, you run an enormous company, 260, the, the notion of having 260,000 employees, like I'm sweating thinking about it. Um, the, uh, you know, many, I think, in Bangalore and, and around the world. And I'm curious both how it, you know, how the last two years and this conversation about the nature of work has impacted your company, you know, who are not millennials, uh, you know, in, in, in Brooklyn, um, or some, I'm sure some are, but, um, and then also whether it's affected you know the, bus your, the business you're in and the products you offer. Oh, let me uh, let me tell you a little bit of how the world has changed, at least from my industry and from our, you know, standpoint. Just over the last two years, as you said, right? The context. Plus 100,000 employees just over the last two years. So net increase of 100,000 employees. Half of our 260,000 employees have joined us over the last two years. So actually. 50% of the company has joined at the time of the pandemic, right, where most of our campuses were closed, right? Uh, the average age of the company is right below 30. That's a fundamental aspect. So when we talk about quiet quitting, I think it's a very important topic and a reflection and an opportunity for us leaders to really reflect on the fact that, yes, the uh, work labor market has fundamentally changed, and how do we need to adjust to that fundamentally as well? What, client, what employees are looking for, are candidates, you know, when they join a company is, they want to join a company that has a culture. They want to feel part of a culture. They want to embrace, you know, the values of the company. Sense of purpose. I'll come back to that, you know, maybe, maybe later, but I think the sense of purpose is incredibly important. Why am I doing this, right? Second, you know, I realize, especially, probably it doesn't help when you have size, uh, sizable teams, is that you need to communicate, 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 connect. It goes actually beyond communicating, it's connecting. How do you make sure that, you know, the people understand where we are going and why? And why do we make the changes? Not only we are going here or we are going there, but this is why we have in mind, this is what we are seeing, this is how we are progressing, so that they feel part of the, the, the journey. 
I think it's fundamental. So those are the elements that we constantly try to bring to in inside organization to make sure, and we never do enough, to be honest, right? To just make sure that people feel I'm part of it and it's exciting. And have the products you offer your customers changed? To ref I mean, have you, are you in, in the business you, in, in response to the, these, what you say are fundamental changes? Yeah, probably you're right, Ben. You know, uh, way back, I would say our industry was very back office, so you would work, you know, with, you know, in centers far away, and then you, were, you would send the work you've done back to clients. Now there's, you know, the world is open. And actually, it's one amazing thing was, you know, the fact of working remotely is that, Actually, wherever you are in the world, doesn't matter. So suddenly, for our colleagues around the world, they connect with their colleagues in different countries, different places, different position, every single day. And so that is different because the connection with clients is also very real today. It may not always be physical, it is often virtual, but it's a lot more connected with you know, the, 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 the end user or the client than it was in the past. And, and Anjali, how is how's, um, Vimeo's product, which I think a lot of people remember as you know a sort of high-end video sharing platform, changed in response to this? I mean, no, not we, just for your management, but for, for your customers. No, we, we've changed um, the business model and approach of Vimeo almost entirely to look at the future of work. Um, so today, the way we think of it, and I think Tara said it well, is like we're all communicating more, but we're not connecting better. And how can we use visual mediums like video? Um, at work, so that outside of just doing video meetings, how are we, how is a CEO sending a video message out so that you can get their emotion and nuance instead of reading an email, which by the way, employees don't read anymore. Um, and, That's <laughs> and when you're training your workforce, you know, none of us in our personal lives read instruction manuals anywhere more. We go to YouTube and watch the video. The idea that we're going to train and inform and enable our workforces um, with documentation and manuals uh, seems quite outdated. So we've actually, uh, our entire business model now is working with the largest companies in the world uh, to be sort of a corporate video platform that enables them to have more modern and human connection. Ben, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, it's so on point because exactly there's, uh, what we have been working with clients is bring the digital enablement within the workplace because it, in very many workplaces, you feel like you're getting 10 years backwards or 20 years backwards and the tools that you have for work, the communication style, the approaches. Uh, so it's, it's beyond video, it's, it's all how you're equipping your employees. I mean, you're in a high tech uh, environment, but many of our clients don't, uh, we're not there yet. And therefore, for that experience to be more seamless that way, mm. including communication. And as you said, um, it's not only the communication, it's the, con it's the connection. Mm. And I think what you're talking about, Angelina, is about that, yeah. utilizing that format to do, to, to make that connection better. Like for example, at Mercer, our town hall now, we, we still have them, we still want to share results, we still want to talk. Uh, but we do it as a, and I'll show my age here, a TV show. And we want to make it as a Netflix on demand. They can watch it whenever. And they have so, there's so much information available now. So you, you pr produce, this, produce it in little sound bites the same. And people dig into what they want to dig into the same way they do at home. So th there's a little bit of self-realization and crafting the, the role, your, your time at work, a little bit more customized to what engages you. So it becomes a little bit more personalized uh, as an experience. I mean, I always, you know, think about like your you know, kids today, they're on TikTok all day. So you have to literally define how you're gonna communicate in a way that's engaging and interactive and lean forward. And it puts a, it's a different onus on leaders. We have to communicate quite differently. Martin, do you see regional, sort of regional geographical variation in, you know, in how these big, both, both the big questions about sort of engagement and the sort of narrower ones about internal communications are changing? I'd say that we see the um, more dynamism in Asia around the use of, um, so for example, uh, our leaders in Asia were the first to adopt those types of uh, different communication means. But that being said, as we adopt them in Europe, in America, in the Amer Americas, it's as relevant. And, and we're all seeing the, 
the vibrant connection we having when we, we communicate and connect in, in all these different ways. So yeah, the, it, Latin America are very, very active as well. So I think we're being pushed. And, and, and the one thing they have in common is much younger population at work. And Thierry, do you see this sort of regional? Well, you know, uh, yes, I think there's different realities in different parts of the world. And I think even inside these regions, there's different situation depending on where you stand, which phase of your career or of your life you are at. Uh, when I think about quiet quitting, one of the uh, reasons sometimes people like, feel like, you know, a little less into the job than, than they were before or they would want to be is you know, the uh, difficulty to find the right balance, work, life, right? And I think you know, in the time of the, co uh, the COVID pandemic, when working from, you know, for some it's been an improvement in, on that aspect. For some others it was not necessarily because they didn't have enough space for working and so on. So it's difficult to really paint you know, with, a, with a broad brush. But one thing that I've observed is that, and I, I, I think we need to recognize that, um, in some part of the world, in Asia in particular, sometimes the commuting may take a few hours per day. Working from home is a huge improvement. And it's a reality. You know, for us to recognize that hybrid model is, you know, is, must be promoted, and we do absolutely embrace hybrid, meaning because it has multiple forms, but saying it's up to the employee to find you know, where, you know, you know, what works for him or her. But we want also, anyway, a certain form of connection, a certain form of you know, coming to the office and meet uh, with others, just because we know. And that's, you know, there's nothing like having a human interaction you know, face to face, going for a coffee, you know, or, or actually going for you know, some of the activities that happen on campus. Now, it is also a fact that you know, there's an improvement in quality for some that do not have to commute every day. And, uh, and in some of the places, it's not even a topic. Yeah. No. Adam, I mean, uh, to go back to something you s initially said about that there's sort of nothing fundamentally new about disengaged employees, what is new? I mean, is anything new really ha that happened in the pandemic? What do you, are, there, are there sort of changes in, that you do see as interesting? I think so. I think that in some ways, quiet quitting is the, the natural sequel to the Great Resignation, right? So if you look at who decided to quit during the pandemic, literally quit, right? It was mostly people who were in toxic workplaces or had abusive bosses. And those people just ran for the hills empirically, right? Um, well, what happened to all the people who couldn't? What did they do? Um, eventually, right, after trying to change their workplaces or their situation and failing, they said, all right, you know what, I'm just going to check out psychologically a little bit. And so I think the, you know, the context of saying, well, we're in a world that gives us more flexibility and freedom to find a better work life. I wasn't able to find that. Um, I think that's different from what we had pre-COVID. But I think underlying that is still a fundamental psychology of fairness. Right? We, haven't, we haven't used the word fairness yet, but um, there's, there's a lot of evidence showing that people try to calibrate their contributions. Right? They're trying to figure out, OK, given what I received from my employer, what's a fair way to reciprocate? Um, and a lot of people feel like that balance tipped you know, too far in the wrong direction. So you know, during COVID, uh, people felt like they were forced to work longer hours. They weren't necessarily given raises for doing that. They were put in stressful circumstances. And so you know, at some point, you say, well, this is not right. You've, you violated. Maybe there wasn't a written contract that you violated, but you violated what's been called the, psych the psychological contract. Um, and now I'm going to basically reciprocate by saying, um, I'm out. I'm doing the bare minimum. And do you buy, you certainly hear employers in fields like, say, journalism complain that their um, employees are drawing sort of new lines, like think a lot about work-life balance, don't consider their jobs their hobbies. I find this sort of incomprehensible. But, um, and, you know, and, and that that's sort of a fundamental social shift. Do you, do you think that's true? I, I don't entirely buy that it's a fundamental shift, um, in part because this has happened with multiple generations. Right, so you know, everybody at some point in their career has said, well, I had to walk five miles or kilometers in the snow barefoot uphill in Davos of all places, which is torture, <laughs> um, in order to, you know, to, to get where I am. And you should have to suffer the same fate. And I think every subsequent generation has put up a boundary and said, no, like, we're not going to tolerate this kind of treatment anymore. We want to break the cycle. 
What's different now is that we have more tools and more ways of expressing our voice. Um, but if you look at the data, there's a psychologist, Jean Twenge, who studies generational differences. And she says a lot of what you think is, uh, is a generational trend is actually an age difference. Because you know, we're, we're confounding the two when we look at generational differences. Is it because you're a millennial or a Gen Z, or is it because you're 23? Um, and overwhelmingly, um, what we see is that people want the same things out of work from every generation. Um, that if you see entitlement in a young workforce, guess what? Um, you were entitled at that age, too. You were just a little bit sneakier about it. So I think there's, um, there's probably more to say about fundamental human psychology reacting to changes in context than there is about fundamental changes in human psychology. There's a, um, I mean, there's an alternate point of view on this, which is that it's basically about tight labor markets and that you know, employees are asserting themselves because you, know, you need them more and they have more leverage. And then maybe as interest rates go up, you, you can stop worrying about all this stuff. And they'll just have to do whatever you want them to do because they need the job. Um, and I guess I think that's particularly true in the conversation right now around engineers who have been like the most, like if there's this incredible um, genre of videos that, that on TikTok that engineers at Silicon Valley companies make about their work day, where they bike in the mornings and then surf and then arrive at work at 10 and make a smoothie, do a little coding, and go home at like 3. Um, <laughs> And, and I think, you know, I was talking to a, you know, a major tech CEO who said that, that you know, the, the, the question everyone has about Elon Musk is like, can he break that culture of engineers, which tech CEOs quietly hate. They would like engineers to work like other employees, but there's so much demand. And I'm curious, I don't know, how, how, I mean, you, you, you two both employ engineers. Are you, how do you navigate that particular, particular supply and demand relationship in that particular labor market? Yeah, I mean, our, half of Vimeo's workforce are engineers, um, and we have uh, R&D centers uh, around the world. Um, and we you know, quadrupled our team during the pandemic. And uh, I would say that, to me, the supply-demand sh dynamic has shifted materially in the last It's easier to hire. Months. Um, yes, and you know companies like Vimeo are doing layoffs, and you know there's a it's a there's been a complete culture shift in the last nine months from what I can see. Wow. You know I I remember the yeah I mean it was just to hire good engineering talent it was so competitive and you were you were throwing packages at people because you had to. Um, I do think that's shifting. Um, I don't think any of that changes the overall kind of opportunity that we have to engage and inspire and connect our teams, to be clear. But um, I do think it's changing. Um, and uh, the way you know, we've thought about it is we are trying to be a bit more proactive about making sure that people that are at Vimeo um, are bought into the culture and actively are choosing to be here. I'll give you an example. Um, we recently did layoffs and we offered a voluntary package for anybody who wasn't excited to be at the company to be able to actively choose to leave. Um, and that's something I don't think I would have done a year ago. I would have been terrified um, of what might happen. And in our case, less than 2% of the team took it. And so culturally, what that enables us to do is say, well, we aren't here quite quitting because we don't have a choice. Um, but we, we're giving you a choice. And, and it makes you kind of reassess why you're coming to work and what you want and whether this company is the right fit. So I think that those types of things are going to happen more and more just because of that supply and demand shift. Do you, how, many, how many engineers do you employ, Thierry? Well, 90% of our employees are, you know, IT engineers. Um, so, you know, I, you know, there are cycles, in, you know, in economy and, you know, ups and downs. But I would say on the long range, there's no doubt that, you know, the demand for talent in technology will continue to be very high. So it's certainly a fantastic sector where as a young uh, graduate, when you are, you know, starting your career, you certainly have a great perspective in front of you to expand and learn a lot of new things. For us, it's really about, you know, how do we um, provide them with as many opportunities to grow, right? So can they move from one technology to another? Can they have a mobility career, right? Can they, you know, aspire to, uh, you know, take a different role or in, work in a different, you know, department of the, of the organization? Can, do they have visibility on their career progression? And I think it's an incredibly important, I feel, aspect of, you know, not only retaining, because, you know, one of the points we talk about is you may retain the body, but not the heart with it, right? Mm -hmm. And we want both, really. 
uh, but really provide a career opportunity, a vision, a vision on how your career could evolve was not so you know, far from now, not five or 10 years, but really one, two, three years time. So people are really uh, drivers, actors of their own you know, career progression. And I think it's, it's um, we see that, that you know, when we are able to develop this mindset in a team, you know, there's a lot more energy and there's a lot more engagement at the end. I saw Martine and Adam both start at various <laughs> points in that, so. Um. Well, First, I'm an actuary by trade, so I've studied demographics, and let's not kid ourselves, the demographic pyramid is not looking in our favor in terms of having a lot of choice uh, in the talent pool. So we need to really go beyond traditional talent pool in terms of how we recruit. Uh, I think, um, back to Adam, what you were saying, the employers who are the most interesting, who are caring for you, who um, will give you learning opportunities, uh, will 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 prevail because um, it, we will have twice as uh, many people as today that are uh, age 60 and over in just 20 some years from now, and therefore. Uh, the number of people who need services and the number of people who can provide them, the pyramid is completely shifting. With many countries here in Europe, the population itself is already declining. Uh, China will be soon. So we, we need to think differently about work. And uh, one, one aspect of it for us uh, that we're, we're, we're really talking about changing from jobs to skills and providing um, people with self-determination, like job crafting their own skill set a little bit like if you're um, if you're American you were in the scouts uh, or the brownies when you were you were young you had the badges and your badges are the different level of competencies that you have in a vast array of um, of skill set abilities knowledge experience and you want to craft that in a way that you access what's missing in your portfolio and what you're interested in so I'm, I'm really thinking about this new ways of organizing work around skills, around matching, around um, this is the type of project it will give you, it requires those skills and will give you these opportunities and you choose to go there. So this whole self-realization, -real determination, I think will be key to attract and keep the best. Um, it goes with the communication, the connection, but it also goes with the whole environment that you are providing as an employer because this, the talent pool is shrinking. Adam? Yeah, when we think about this problem of, of keeping the best in particular, I'm seeing a lot of CEOs scramble and say, OK, we've got to, we've got to do exit interviews to figure out from the people who actually left right, what we can do to keep the people we want to stay. I'm a big fan of exit interviews, just this one little issue. It is the dumbest time to run them. Like, why would you wait until people have already committed to walk out the door to say, if only I had a time machine? I would go back to the past and convince you to stay. What I would much rather see employers do are entry interviews and stay interviews. Um, entry interview is just asking the same questions you would normally pose at exit at the beginning of the employment relationship. <laughs> Why are you here? Yeah. What are you hoping to learn? Right? What are some of the best projects you've worked on? Tell me about the worst boss you've ever had. So we can try to emulate the good and avoid the bad. And then, obviously, not everyone's a new hire. With existing people, um, it's your job to invest in making this a place that they would want to stick around at. right? So in a stay interview, you ask very similar questions. Um, what has been the, the defining highlight of your experience here? Um, what have been the lowlights? What made you consider quitting? And how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? And that should be an ongoing conversation. I'm going to add one thing to that, um, which is something that we've been experimenting with more that I am optimistic about, which is, um, also shifting the conversation from it is a tops down like leader's job to create and, and solve this problem and actually in, make it a culture and it's, it's your team, you all together are part of finding the solution. And what I found is like instead of me being like, how, you know, let me interview you and you tell me what's not working and you know, it sort of becomes a, an opportunity to complain and displace the joint responsibility. And what we found is we've actually gotten like some of our most tenured and engaged employees to get up and do in our town halls panels and talk about what they're doing to drive more culture and improve Vimeo's culture. And I found that to be like quite a powerful way to take us away from an us versus them mentality and, and just sort of um, double down on the fact that we are a collective and collectively like we're building a better company. 
that, you know, I just sort of listening to how you all think about this and, and looking at those kind of WEF goals, it feels like there are kind of two slightly different approaches to kind of this engagement question, one of which is essentially progressive workplace values. The, you know, the WEF stuff is really entirely about treating people well, paying them, encouraging diversity, sort of, you know, things that could apply to any company. Um, and then the other is about mission and about, in some sense, you know, the kind of Elon Musk approach. Like, we want people who are har so hardcore that they don't care if, the, you know, there's toilet paper in the bathroom and their salaries are paid on time. Um, and, I th and, and to me, those things feel a little bit intention, actually, sort of mission versus these very abstract questions about fairness and employment. And, you know, and I think, you know, there's some, you'll sometimes see people say they think that the mission stuff is sort of a con and sort of a trick by employers to, to you know, to, so that they don't have to do these things. And I'm curious if you see those things in tension, if you see them as the same. I've never thought about them in tension. Um, I just think they're both two sides of the coin. You know, you have to pay people and treat them well. And you, are, you should be incented to do that because that's how they will do their best work, which will then lead to the best business results. Um, but I think the, the reality is, I think you said it, like it's not just your body, it's your heart. And you will get so much better work out of somebody if they feel part of the culture and mission. So I, I think these are kind of all necessary things for us as leaders. Um, mm -hmm. And my bet is that the mission side o over the next kind of couple of years will become even more important. And I agree, like differ for differentiating employer brands, I think it's going to become really critical. And just we'll take questions in just yeah. a moment. So please think of questions. And Ben, yes. if I can jump on, on that. Yeah, every um, week, actually, I have a used to be kind of breakfast, but now you are doing it virtually, right? It allows you to have people from different places around the world, but re really different level of the organization. 15 people, one hour, just a no agenda, nothing. It's just a normal discussion, like you would have you know, uh, in the cafeteria. What, what, I'm, what I find striking is that the number one reason for the people to really be happy at Wipro is the fact that they know that at Wipro, two thirds of the uh, equity ownership goes to a philanthropic trust. So it means that they know that every time we drive growth and profitability, it goes to actions, philanthropic activities in the world. And they can take pride of that. And I think if I take a bit of distance from that, I believe that, of course, I agree with you at the end of the day, you know, they need to be well paid and they need to be well treated and all of that. But they aspire to something more. They aspire to something that gives a sense to the part of their life. It's not all their life. They have life outside of the office, of course, but they spend so much time, whether they work from home or not, by the way. They spend so much time for the company. They prefer to have a company that is really focusing on having an impact in the world. And so for me, it really goes back to the question of the culture, the sense of what you're doing and why. Obviously, if you narrow and, and go one level down, it could be about you know, truly understanding why what you're doing every day, which may be a task or a selection of tasks, has a fundamental impact for someone else. And I think, again, it is um, uh, really articulating the, the reasons, the, the, the drivers that give a sense to what we are doing. I think, as always, our people are you know, wonderful, um, they have the right attitudes, they want to do good, uh, but they don't necessarily always know how. This is our job to make sure they do. Uh, yeah, I, I think we have to be very careful when, you know, when we cultivate and also attract people with a sense of purpose um, that we don't end up taking advantage of that. Um, and I think in the wrong hands, mission can be used as a device for exploitation, right? There's research on what's called the passion tax which is the idea that if I love my job, my manager is more likely than to um, stick me with unrewarded, unthanked work, um, to dump meaning, uh, menial tasks on me, uh, to basically ask me to do extra work in my free time without any compensation. Um, and I don't think that people who love their jobs and are deeply passionate about their work should be taxed for that, right? That should be rewarded. I thought it was supposed to be its own compensation. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's my view. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Like the, you should you should thank us that we're giving you the chance to experience this joy and meaning, right? That, you know, that is my view about being a reporter. But um, you know, be, be, beats working for a living. Um, but I realize it's a minority view, and I try not to tell my employees because they they don't really buy that. Um, the uh, yeah, I think we we have time. We have about ten minutes for some questions. Is there a microphone floating around, or should people just ah? We have a microphone. I uh, want in the front row here. Yes, and please just keep them tight. Um, so, so we talked about two hypotheses for uh, the post-pandemic relationship between employers and talent. One was that nothing is different. The other is that it's because of tight labor markets. Can I throw out a third hypothesis and just ask for your perspectives on it? Third hypothesis is that we're dealing with an environment in which a lot of people experienced serious trauma, um, death, um, professional hardship. You know, they didn't know what doing a good job looked like. We dumped a lot on them during the pandemic. And that must be different. I mean, our parents didn't have two years of trauma, you know. Uh, so something must be different about that. I don't know. That's just a question. Pretend that was a question. <laughs> Close <laughs> enough. Anyone I, I think it's a really important observation. I think the jury is still out. I think on the one hand, there's a, there's a strong case that what we are seeing in some cases is a, is a trauma response. Um, we know that levels of grief, um, loneliness, um, burnout, distress, right? All the psychological symptoms of the pandemic did spike in the early days. What's surprising though to a lot of people is that that was a, a shorter blip than many of us have assumed, right? So if you look at the data in the US and UK, for example, um, by the summer of 2020, uh, there was a, a pretty significant rebound. Um, and even some cases of post-traumatic growth, right? People saying, I have taken this as an occasion to, you know, to reevaluate my work and my life. And now I've, I have more meaning, I have stronger connections. And so um, I'm not sure how that's gonna play out in the long run. I think the other, the other sort of piece of data that speaks to this a little bit on, on this being a trauma response is um, if we look at what most employees have, have gone through globally, um, what we see is that many, many people have, uh, have said, okay, this is a, a watershed event for me, a little bit like 9-11 was uh, in the US, and um, I now have higher expectations of my employer, and when those are met, uh, unmet, then I'm even more likely then to disengage. But I think fundamentally, when, you know, when we look at the, the psychology of, of trauma responses, we, we see that there's a huge range, right? So in any given traumatic event, about 15% or 20% of people will, will face PTSD. And then many, many people will bounce back. Quite a few will bounce forward. Um, and I think it is too early to tell right now uh, what COVID is going to look like. But there is good evidence that um, when people have to start their careers in difficult circumstances, um, they end up long term more grateful to have a job. Uh, they end up more satisfied with their work. This is Emily Bianchi's research. And this is another way that employers can take advantage of employees, right? You are so lucky to have this terrible job. But um, I think that you know, in the long run, if this is a trauma response, one of the reset effects it's going to have is leading people to say, you know what, I should not take for granted having decent employment. I, I, I think that, OK, from a, for, for most, it was not that traumatic, uh, apart from you realized there was a different way to work. You realize there was, uh, for some in industries that were highly impacted and realized they're in vulnerable types of industries and very often at the lower end of the ra uh, pay range, uh, there might have been uh, more of a trauma in terms of what am I doing here, why, and you're, you've seen a lot of people quitting those industries. But in the main, uh, for people, it was more re realization that of all that's happening outside of their work sign because they were working from home, seeing the kids come in for, you know, from school or doing their schooling or their spouse and how their spouse were living their, their daily lives and, uh, and even just eating in your kitchen, to, which I've never done for like for 35 years. Uh, all kinds of different things that you say, is there a different way to live this life, uh, to, to this work life in particular, that will give me a little bit more of both. And we're trying to establish hybrid types of working. It's a grand experiment. We haven't, we, we haven't crack that nut, I don't think, just yet. There's certainly something quite interesting in that uh, to address this realiza grand realization that such a huge portion of the population have had that lives can be lived a little bit differently. Um, Julia? Thank you, great discussion. Julia Hobsbawm, no, the Nowhere Office Project and the work shift column for Bloomberg. How optimistic or pessimistic are you that the C-suites can in fact step up to the plate when the evidence would suggest 
that they haven't. Uh, the metrics pre-pandemic with stress and low productivity showed they didn't get the memo. The $400 billion annual spend on leadership development training that doesn't appear to have worked through, etc. And of course the demographic that the C-suites are not made up of Gen Zs who are fast accelerating. So how optimistic or pessimistic are you that you can be cloned at scale <laughs> in the boardrooms around the world? How can we clone um, you? Sure. Yeah, uh, I'm quite optimistic. Um, but I do agree we have to have, this is why I say we talk about reskilling of the workforce. I think we need a reskilling of leaders, period. Mm. Um, and, uh, and whether that means generationally or not, uh, we have to show up for employees differently. The way we inspire them and create culture has to be different. The way we communicate and inform has to be different. But I, you know, to me, there's just an intentionality that any, any of us as leaders, we can do. But it takes change. It takes being self-aware. It takes adopting new mediums and technologies and trying things that you know, your PR comms team is going to tell you absolutely don't do that. Right? And they're going to say, right, say the script. And then you're going to realize, well, if I want to be authentic for my employees, they need to feel like they're having a conversation with a real person. Um, and so I think it's going to take courage and experimentation. Um, but you know, I think maybe the good news for us is we don't really have a choice. Uh, and, and employees are going to demand it. And ultimately, for us to deliver on the bottom line, we have to have impact from our teams. So I think the incentives are aligned, um, which is why I'm yeah. optimistic. I would absolutely echo what you just said. I, I absolutely agree. So I certainly share the same optimism. I think we are learning, you know, by experience or by experimenting, I would say also. I think at the end of the day, you know, I think it's a life lesson as well. You know, we need to recognize that, uh, you know, industry uh, companies can no longer be as vertical as they were right, that people want to be empowered, that they want to, you know, keep the choice, so they are not going to do it because they have to, but because they believe in it. And so I think every, we need to reflect on the fact that, you know, we need to, to build the world for, for them. I often think about the, the 31 years old average employee of Wipro, who's 20 plus years younger than me and you know do I understand them how do we make sure that we understand them how do we make sure that we really understand how they see the world versus how we see the world and what you know and and we often have discussion with our leadership and you know the the, the what we call the middle management who are you know in different level of the organization to really see you know, where, where, where are the gaps in understanding. I take a simple example, which is um, quite basic and yet uh, always uh, you know, uh, destabilizing for some leaders is the younger don't read emails. And do we have time maybe for one or two more questions? We have no, we do not. Um, people are making this gesture. Sorry, folks. Um, well, th thank, <laughs> th thank you all so, so much for participating in this. It was, um, I feel like I got a lot of good advice. And I was, you know, it was interesting. I think I was expecting to hear that you were seeing huge differences regionally and globally. And it really sounds like the workplace culture is really globalized to a pretty remarkable degree. Um, yeah, so I will take all the good advice you've given and back to my tiny company. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.